It is now my great pleasure to introduce you to our final keynote speaker this morning. For 13 years, David Pogue was the weekly personal technology columnist for the New York Times. He joined Yahoo in 2013, where he founded a new website for non-techies called Yahoo Tech. He's won two Emmy Awards for his TV work, which includes hosting Nova on PBS and serving as a correspondent for CBS Sunday Morning since 2002. With over three million books in print, David is one of the world's best-selling how-to authors. He wrote or co-wrote seven books in the Four Dummies series, including Max, Magic, Opera, and Classical Music. In 1999, he launched his own series of complete funny computer books called The Missing Manual Series, which now includes 120 titles. David graduated summa cum laude from Yale in 1985 with distinction in music, and he spent 10 years conducting and arranging Broadway musicals in New York. He has won two Emmys, a Loeb Award for Journalism, and an honorary doctorate in music. He has been profiled on 48 Hours and 60 Minutes. Please help me welcome Mr. David Pogue. Well, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. <laughs> anyway, very nice to meet you. Uh, my job has always been to uh, observe and critique uh, uh, technology trends, consumer technology trends, but more important than the gadgets is how it affects society and culture. That's my favorite topic, and since the theme here is the future, I'll, I'll fit right in. I, I found that picture on Flickr. I thought it would sort of suggest impact and drama and change, and now that I see it, I just think it looks like the cover of Dianetics. I, I gotta change that. Anyway, I'm, I'm glad you made your way here today. Had you taken a left turn instead of a right turn, you would have found yourself across the street at the Hyatt, where you would have been greeted by this. It's the fertilizer convention. And uh, in case you're wondering what that is, they represent, promote, and protect those with a vested interest in fertilizer. Doesn't everybody? The, the farther you go into that conference, the funnier the signs get. There's a fertilizer hospitality suites. I know, could there really be a conference like that? I think it's a load of bull. <laughs> hey, you got it, okay. Anyway, so I have, uh, I have three great kids, but I swear sometimes I look at them and I see that. I mean, there's always been a, a generation gap, but I would posit that in the last few years the, the gap has widened um, I would say that it is because of this. Um, I don't know why we actually call it a phone. Those of you who have children know that the last thing they'll do with this is talk into it. Um, it is everything else. It is a computer, it is an internet terminal, but it is not for talking into. Um, everything I'm going to be talking about today stemmed from this, from the touchscreen smartphone, the iPhone and its imitators. Um, <laughs> what, you going to argue? Um, all the modern developments, all of these things all sprang from the fact that for the first time in human history we have a perpetual internet connection. And you think about the, the ingredients they've packed into here, you know, input and output for audio and video, there's all these sensors, a tilt sensor, a light sensor, proximity sensor. Uh, in the latest iPhones and Android phones they have added um, a barometer, because I guess the people were clamoring for a barometer. Um, and then people write apps that take advantage of these things. As you may have read, there's 1.3 million apps for the iPhone, similar number for Android. Um, and and here's, here's one of them. Uh, I just think this is such a classic example. Um, this is called ocarina. An ocarina is a South American wind instrument. It's a little clay flute. So this music teacher from California wrote an app for a dollar that simulates the ocarina. So that's what it looks like. There are these four little holes that you learn to finger and you blow into the microphone. So I only know one song, but it's really great.
So you, you tip it when you want. Oh, oh, thank you very much. Yes. That's all I got. Thank you very much. No, you, you tip it when you want vibrato. So you can get very expressive with your phone. Um, yeah, your, your kids sit in the back of the car riding their brain on video games. Mine are practicing their music. Um, so it became a huge mega hit. The guy, there's 3,500 pieces of ocarina sheet music. Um, the, the guy became a millionaire overnight. He sold a million and a half copies in six months. What are you people doing here? Get out there! Um, there are all these videos on YouTube of, of ocarina performances. This one is five college kids doing Stairway to Heaven. I have no idea what that... Anyway, so the point is, it is no longer, if it was ever, a phone. It is everything else, and it has launched industry after industry on its own. Uh, this one might impact some of you guys. You're hearing a lot about the Internet of Things. I, I'll be straight with you. I cannot stand that term, the Internet of Things. Like, it's, it's grammatically just so, you don't talk like that, you know. I'm going to put on my jeans of blue. You know, you don't, it's like Yoda, help you I will. It's just, anyway. And, and basically, it just what it means is it means ordinary household appliances and things that are networkable, that can be controlled from the phone. So, you know, uh, uh, light LED lights that you can control and dim and change the color from your phone. Uh, this is the, the Internet of Things coffee maker, Internet of Things door locks. Uh, you know, the example is, you know, your mother-in-law comes to visit and you're at work and she arrives early, you can unlock the door for her from your office. Or if it's like my mother-in-law, you can lock the doors from the episode. Um, the doorbells, uh, uh, you can start your car. Uh, this is the robotic vacuum cleaner. Um, this is one I reviewed last year. It's a, uh, it's a tiny little security camera that you can put in your vacation home or your regular home. And then on your phone or your tablet, you can see the image from the camera, wherever you are in the world, over the internet. Although, <laughs> I have to say, the, on the lower right here, that's their ad. That's the ad for this thing. They've got the young mom at the office <laughs> keeping a watchful eye on her newborn baby at home. <laughs> Is that the use case, really? Oh, she's got her head between the bars again. <laughs> I'm not sure they're really thinking this through. Um, anyway, this is one of the Internet of Things uh, success stories. This is the Nest thermostat. Uh, the guy who created this was at Apple for 18 years where he oversaw a little product called the iPod. And then this was his next project. I have two of these things. It's the it was the first Internet-connected thermostat. Oh, wow. Okay, so, so I have two of these. I have one upstairs and one downstairs. I live in Connecticut, where it is a snow day today. It is freezing cold. There's nobody home but my children. And I don't know if we can cut to the live camera for this, but they have it cranked to 74 degrees. <laughs> like I'm made of money. Like, it's, anyway. So the amazing thing is I can stand here in Orlando, Florida, and I can see that. I can see exactly what, oh yeah, there we go. Well, actually, that's, that's a good point. I can not only see the temperature at my home, I can adjust it. <laughs> they can put on a goddamn sweater. <laughs> that's magic! All right, I'll, I'll cut them some slack here. There will be some conversation tonight at dinner. Um, anyway, so the Internet of Things is getting incredible amounts of hype and everything possible is being connected, washers and dryers and cars and everything else. Um, the truth is it's not really catching on. I, I don't know anyone uh, where I live who has any Internet of Things things. And I think one of the reasons is that 
each device that you get requires a different app. And so therefore, there are, it's, a, it's, it's very splintered, it's too confusing, it's too much to learn. So the big trend in 2015, ironically, was companies attempting to unify all these different gadgets under a single app. There, there came out all these Internet of Things hubs that were going to attempt to unify your Nest thermostat and your camera and your doorbell and your drapes. Um, the only thing is that now we have 40 of those all different brands and protocols. So we have a ways to go before it shakes out uh, and becomes common. Um, here's a, a, an electronic success story that I don't know if you've even heard about, but it will touch every one of you. This is USB-C. USB-C is a new connector type. <laughs> You guys are going to go, home. hey, honey, what'd you learn in Orlando? Guy was talking about a jack, you know. Um, but this is, this is amazing. 600 electronics companies, including Apple and Google, Intel, Microsoft, Texas Instruments, all worked together to develop the successor to USB, which we all hate because it's 20 years old. We've reached the maximum speed. You, half the time you put it in upside down and it won't go in. Um, this thing does not have that problem. It does not have an, a right side up. Either way works. It does not have an end for end. Both ends work. And get this, it is both a USB jack for data and a power jack for the new MacBook and a data, a video data output jack for projectors and monitors. That's the new MacBook on the left. Uh, it only has one jack. This one jack is all it has because the same jack can conduct power, video, and data simultaneously. Of course, you might wonder, well, what if I want to plug in my MacBook and have a USB stick installed? And for that, Apple is happy to sell you an $80 splitter. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, all of the manufacturers are going to USB-C. So everything from Google, all the Chromebooks, the, the phones, the tablets, uh, all of Microsoft and Nokia's new stuff, all Samsung's new stuff, all have USB-C. It's as small as micro USB, but much faster than any of that. And here's the kicker. The same power cord will now work for every device from every manufacturer. The same one. They're calling it the Jesus Jack. You can be in an airport lounge and your iPhone is dying and say, can I borrow your Dell laptop cord? And it will work. You are alive to see the day. So phones, laptops, tablets, one cord to, to rule them all. This is like fantastic. And it's now. It's happening now. Um, actually, there's even better news. I don't know if any of you are into like electricity or engineering or anything. Um, but this is the next step to get rid of the freaking power cord altogether. This is coming, this is within a year, this is wireless power. You will get these things that look like Wi-Fi routers, but it will instead blanket the room with radio wave power. So it can charge 12 devices in the room at the same time. They may, not need, they may someday not even need a jack for power on your devices, because it will be, every room you go in will have these. I, I got to interview the guy who makes this. This is a little bit of the, the interview. So here. what we're going to show you today is our transmitter. This is our second generation uh, transmitter. And with this, we are going to wirelessly charge the smartphone and also simultaneously charge a votive candle here, which is representative of a wearable. As you can see, it is now charging, currently, currently charging. charging. So it's charge. It's sending some kind of wave. Ah, my hand! It's gone. <laughs> my hand! No, no. I'm Actually, not the truth. <laughs> so, all right. So, how is that possible? It's not plugged in. There's no mat. There's no. It's an RF signal that is emanating from an antenna array here and is focusing a, a a pocket of power around the device. Now I can turn that one off, and I can turn on the votive candle and um, it will uh, light up, again, representative of the similar power requirements for your wearable. And, and why aren't we worried about our intestines turning to cooked steak as we walk past them? Very good question. Um, let me just answer by saying if this device is safe, 
then this technology is an order of magnitude safer. And it relates to the frequency that we use, which is non-penetrative, oh. and to the concentration of power. So, oh, ignore that. Um, so what's interesting is that thing about that he said, it, it's, it reflects off of skin, this RF signal. So it, it can't get inside you and hurt you. In fact, he had one of the interested parties was the pacemaker companies. They were all excited because if you have a pacemaker right now, every 10 years you have to go have surgery to change the battery. So imagine if you could be just charging wirelessly all the time. You said, no, that won't work because our RF signals won't go through skin. So anyway, but he's got 100 electronics companies lining up to put this stuff into their things. There's a, uh, a refrigerator company who's going to have wireless power in your kitchen. And TV makers are going to have those blanketing your living room with wireless power. So that will be very cool. Um, a few years ago, this was all the buzzword, Web 2.0. And, and these are websites where, instead of the owner of the website creating the words and the pictures, uh, the visitors to the website put up the material. And if you think about it, all of these sites were created on this principle. The audience creates the material, right? Facebook and Craigslist for ads and YouTube for videos, Flickr for pictures, and Wikipedia. Who ever thought that Wikipedia would fly? You know, an encyclopedia where any idiot can write anything. Um, and yet, somehow, it, it manages to thrive. It's been shown to be as accurate as the Encyclopedia Britannica, which is, as you might have read last year, ceased publication. There is no longer a printed encyclopedia. I, um, <laughs> I, I like the readers. My, I used to read my mom's Reader's Digest magazines. They have these joke columns. And one of them was true life anecdotes sent in by working people. And one of them was from a college librarian who reported that on the first week of classes, a freshman walks into the college library and says, whoa, what are all those matching books? And she's like, well, son, that's the encyclopedia. And he goes, dude, somebody actually printed out the whole thing? <laughs> We've crossed some kind of line. Um, Anyway, so this principle, oh, and here's another one that you haven't heard of. This is, this is one of my favorites. This is whoissick.org. <laughs> you, <laughs> you click off your symptoms, bloody stool, blurred vision, <laughs> clammy skin. <laughs> it's like my kids on a good day. Uh, and then it collates that data, and you watch the bugs drift over your neighborhood. How awesome is that? Um, but anyway, but the cool thing that's happened in the last year or so is that this, this same idea of connecting people with very specific mutual interests via the internet has now entered the, the physical world. They're, they're, I, it doesn't really have a name. I'm calling it World 2.0 or, or the sharing economy, some people call it. And the, the poster child is like Airbnb, right? You go to a new city, Instead of staying in a hotel where every room is alike and you pay a lot of money, you look over the portfolio's pictures of people's homes, their apartments and houses that they won't be home for, and they're renting it out to you to stay in for much less money. You look over pictures of the place and read reviews of people who've already stayed there, how's the Wi-Fi, and stuff like that. They rented out 13 million nights of lodging last year. They hope to rent out... 100 million nights of lodging in four years, which is more than hotels rent out. Um, here's another example. This is TaskRabbit. Same idea, except you're renting out your time. So people list the grunt work they want done, like teach me French or take me to the airport or clean my gutters or whatever. And then people bid to see who can do that for the least money. It's fantastic. So. My wife was in San Francisco she, for a business trip. She had uh, an important presentation. She woke up sick. And she's like, oh my god, I don't have Kleenex or Echinacea or vitamin C. I'm, I'm just not equipped for this. So I thought, well, here's what I'll do. I'll try out this TaskRabbit thing. So I'm like, I need somebody to go to the drugstore and buy this, these supplies and deliver it to her desk with a note that says, you know, hope you're feeling better, love you, you know. And so this college kid wound up doing it for 20 bucks. He went to Walgreens in San Francisco, bought echinacea, vitamin C, and Kleenex, and delivered it to her at her desk before her pre... She thinks I'm a god. She's, she's like, 
Ed, how did you do that? It was like, it's so amazing. Uh, so a little tip for you, gentlemen. There's a... Anyway, the other huge sharing economy success story is Uber, of course. They're in 300 cities now. It started out with this effect. It's an app where you see the locations of black cars, like professional car service cars nearby. You say, pick me up. And then it says, okay, the driver's coming. His name's Simon. This is his rating. He'll be here in two minutes. And then, and this is the reason it's been so successful, I think. When you get out, you don't pay. You don't pull out your wallet or your purse. You just say, thanks, bye. And all the billing is done on the back end. So you, you feel like you, you have a personal chauffeur on call. It makes everybody feel a little bit better about themselves. But here's the really cool thing. So there was Uber and there was Uber SUV, where you summon an SUV. Last year, they launched this, Uber X. This is not professional car service cars. This is ordinary Americans in their family car who've got some time to kill and want to make a few bucks. Anyone can do it. You can do it. I, this is, it's the, and it's a fraction of the price of a taxi. I'll never forget, the first time I was, I was in Chicago, I had to get to the airport. I'm like, okay, I'll try it. Pick me up. And she came in three minutes. Her name was Heather, 40-year-old soccer mom in a Honda CRV. She pulls up. I didn't know if I should get in the front seat or the back seat. I didn't, like, and, um, and then she's like, oh, here, want a bottle of water? Or here, I see you have an iPhone. Look, I've got the charging cable for you. I'm like, when has a taxi driver ever offered me that? You know? And it was just amazing. The conversation was good. She wasn't like yammering in the phone or she didn't smell. It was like an amazing experience. And I mean, I will never take a a, a, a cab in an Uber X city again is, is fantastic. Um, same idea is, is Lyft, uh, ordinary citizens picking you up in their car when they have free time. Uh, and you can apply this idea to almost anything. This is Parking Panda, where instead of, when you go to the airport, instead of leaving your car in the airport hotel for $45 a night, sorry, garage, in the garage, 45 bucks, you leave it in somebody's driveway for $8 who lives nearby. Uh, dog vacay, instead of putting your dog in a kennel when you go out of town, you leave it with a dog lover in their apartment or their house, and they have children, and they will play with it and walk it and love it. The dog will pay you to do this. Uh, um, <laughs> Rentoid is a, a World 2.0 site where you rent out your belongings that not every single person in America needs one of, like you know, a, a power drill. Can I borrow your power drill for four bucks for the weekend or snow blower or whatever? Um, I, as I mentioned, I live in Connecticut. Uh, there was this one summer when four families on my street on the same block put in swimming pools. It was like an arms race. Like everybody had to put in a swimming pool. And so my kids were like, Dad, can we get a pool too? And I said, no, we don't need five houses on the same street with $100,000 holes in the ground. But I'll tell you what I will do. I will make the following offer to our four neighbors who have put in pools. If you will let us come and swim when you're not using the pool, I will pay for half the maintenance, the chemicals and the cleaning and the pool boy and all that stuff. So of the four neighbors, guess how many said okay? Zero. <laughs> I told you, it's Connecticut. Yeah, you will not put your skin in my water, you know, like, um, ridiculous. Uh, um, although, I have to tell you, um, after, after I gave a talk and told that story, uh, this little old lady came up during the meet and greet afterwards and said, uh, my name's Tilly, I live in Scarsdale, I have a pool. My children have been grown up for 40 years, you can come any time. So. So now we go to Scarsdale. Um, anyway, all of this is very upsetting to the hotel and the taxi industry, very disruptive. There are uh, uh, demonstrations and petitions and lawsuits, um, tire slashings. Uh, I don't know if you read uh, last spring in, in France, uh, the taxi drivers were running around turning over Uber cars and lighting them on fire. So yeah, don't forget, any of you can sign up. It's, uh, <laughs> um, so it's very disruptive, but you know what? You cannot put this genie back in the bottle. This is 
this is the future, this is the way it is, it makes eminent sense. We all have these phones with us all the time, so all of this is now possible. Uh, hearing a lot about wearable technologies, um, this was the Google Glass, which was a huge failure. Highly hyped, highly excited, but nobody wanted them. They, they nailed the technology of it, which is interesting, because what it does is it puts sort of this tiny screen over your eyebrow that shows the sort of things that your phone would show you, text messages and driving directions and stuff like that. Um, and it's all very, a very nice interface. You can use voice control, or there's a little trackpad on the earpiece there. Um, but it failed, not for technological, but for social reasons. First of all, it's 1,500 bucks, so everyone knows that you spent that much to be an early adopter. Second of all, you're, you look like a freaking cyborg with this thing on your, on your face. Um, and there's a camera. That little, that little dot is a camera. And there's no record light. There's no indication when you're filming the person you're talking to or taking pictures. So, of course, they're instantly banned in courtrooms, in restaurants, theaters, um, God knows locker rooms. Uh, so they withdrew them for the, from the market, and there arose a, uh, a term for people who have these things. They, they call them glass holes. Um, <laughs> And, well, they should. Um, Google says that they're working on a new version that will have a record light. Uh, they're going to come out with it this year or next year. Maybe. I have my doubts as to whether it'll ever be mass accepted. I think, you know what I think? I think it'll be like something like the Segway scooter. Remember, everyone said the Segway would revolutionize American cities. And now, who has them? You know, mall cops. Um, so I think they'll find their niches, you know, like, like they say, they'll be great for surgeons, you know, uh, wearing Google Glass. You know, doctor, what is this structure here? Why, that's a liver. You know, like they can <laughs> check it out. Um, smart watches, everybody wants smart watches to become a thing. So many headlines. And yet normal people simply are not buying them, not even Apple's. Um, I think it's because they're too, they're too clunky, they're too big, they're too expensive. You have to charge them every night. Who wants to take off your watch and charge it every night? It's ridiculous. This is the actual Moto 360 smartwatch. I, I see people with that every now and then. I'm like, you might as well wear a tractor wheel. You know, like, <laughs> it's so big. Um, there is, there's one exception to that, though, and this is a big exception, and that is the wearable fitness trackers. Um, these things have been, been a mega hit, and they started out as glorified pedometers. You guys know what an accelerometer is, right? So it has a three-axis accelerometer in there. And the way these things work is when you're walking, it tracks your steps by translating the motion of the accelerometer into what activity you're doing. And when you're sleeping, it says, oh, he must be asleep because his arm is doing this pattern. So for thousands of years, hundreds of years, the only time we ever had insight into the workings of our body is when we went to see the doctor for 10 minutes once a year, now we wake up and we see these graphs of how our activity is and how our sleep is. We can compare it to our, our spouses and so on. It's just an amazing amount of motivational insight. And now it's gone way beyond the accelerometer. Now it's, they're not just step counters. There's hundreds of these things in every category. Uh, this thing tracks your sunlight exposure. This one tracks your posture. It beeps a few if you're slouching. Um, this is the health tracking scale, not just your weight, but your body mass, your heart rate. Um, it, my wife bought one that has a, a handle that uses galvanic response to estimate your uh, biological age. And she, she's 47. She got one of these. She says, oh, look, honey, it says I'm 38. She's a marathon runner and eats quinoa and all that stuff. Um, so she's like, you try it, honey. So I'm 52, and they went, bleep, bleep, you're 59. <laughs> so obviously it's a piece of crap. Um, <laughs> still in its infancy, I'm afraid. Um, but anywhere you can put these cheap little sensors against your skin, they are putting them. This is the health tracking t-shirt. Health tracking earbuds gets your pulse from your ears while you're listening to music, because that's a very good place to get your pulse. This is the health tracking bike helmet. These are the health tracking baseball caps and sweatbands. 
Apparently, this one not only tracks your pulse, but also makes you hostile. <laughs> I don't know why they're all so angry. Um, this is the health tracking bra. Uh, these are the health tracking sweat socks. This is the health tracking fork. Oh, yeah. This thing is cool. Um, it uses galvanic response in the tines to know when it's against your lips. So your, your phone sits next to your plate, and if you eat too fast, if you're shoveling food, the phone goes, eh, goes all red, and it says, slow down. <laughs> it's like having your mom with you at all times. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, the next slide I'm, I'm a little nervous about. Uh, please remember, I'm just the messenger. I don't mean to offend anybody. Uh, just, I'm just telling you that anywhere they can put sensors against your skin. Oh, yeah. This is the sex fit. Um, this is for the gentleman to wear uh, during times of intimacy. And I don't know if you can see it from back there on this tiny screen up here, but it says it has LED performance indicator lights. <laughs> and it tracks the gentleman's uh, rate and his vigor. And at his option, the data can be posted in real time to Facebook. <laughs> Not kidding. Yeah, there are some places that Bluetooth really should not go. Um, anyway, so initially, these accelerometer-based devices came under some fire because they're not, they're not medical devices. They're not really scientifically accurate. The New York Times did this infographic showing how an accelerometer works, and it just generates that motion data, and then software has to interpret the activity you're doing. Um, and the Times pointed out that from the, from the software's point of view, the act of doing bicep curls looks identical to the act of eating Doritos. <laughs> However, I hasten to point out that was in 2011 and the technology has marched on a lot. These things are becoming scarily good. This is the Microsoft Band. It, it tracks ultraviolet light exposure, so it tells you when you're going to get a sunburn. And your pulse. It has built-in GPS, so if you go for a run or a bike ride, you don't need to take your phone. Google X is working on this one. This one is even more sophisticated. It tracks your exposure to light and sound. Google is also working on this. This is the, uh, the contact lens that those two little squares there, that's a battery and a Bluetooth transmitter. This thing senses, measures the glucose levels of your tears. It's for diabetics who, as you may know now, currently have to stick themselves multiple times a day to check their insulin levels. This thing will check it in your tears. And all you'll have to do is look at your phone. And this is real, and it works. It's in testing right now. Um, the one frustrating thing about all of this is all these 70 million people a year buying these devices, these wearable, health devices are, I mean, if you think about it, it's the biggest clinical trial ever conducted. It's hundreds of millions of people wearing medical monitoring devices and then throwing away the data, right? It's all siloed, it's all password protected, every app is different. I couldn't share my Fitbit data with my doctor if I wanted to. And so I, I heard a doctor say the other day, the tragedy is that the, the answers, the cures to some cancers are in those terabytes an hour of data that we're just chucking. If we could only harness it and parse it and sort it the right way. And that would have been the really depressing end of that slide right there. Um, but last year, Apple came out with this research kit, which allows medical researchers to create apps like these for specific diseases, Parkinson's and asthma, heart disease, breast cancer, and you opt in. It says, we, this is our institution, this is the doctor's name, this is what data we intend to collect from your phone or your fitness band, and this is what we're gonna do with it. Do you give us permission to let us monitor you? 
And incredibly, in, even in this paranoia, privacy-obsessed culture, 82% of customers who are offered this choice willingly contribute, their, their, they allow themselves to be tracked for medical purposes. Really exciting. Um, the last huge megatrend that's going on right now is the arrival of robots and artificial intelligence. And I don't just mean like walking robots. I mean every kind of robots. Um, those of you who work in, in utilities might remember this, uh, this Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster. It turns out that it wouldn't have been such a disaster if the employees had had the presence of mind to turn off the water, to shut off the, the valves before they left. But they were terrified, they didn't, they left the plant, it flooded, and it became a huge disaster. So DARPA, you guys know what DARPA is? This is the coolest branch of your government. You should know what it is. It's the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. It's a small group with a big budget, and they give out million dollar grants to the public to solve technological problems. So the self-driving car, by the way, came from a DARPA grant that was a competition. Here's a million dollars. Who can complete a race course in a self-driving car? And you know who the guy who won it? Elon Musk, who then went to Google, and there he is. So uh, Google bought it. So DARPA also brought us this little thing called the internet. That was a DARPA project. The cell phone network, that was a DARPA project. And they looked at this Fukushima thing and said, you know what would have solved that problem? Robots, autonomous, humanoid, bipedal walking robots, which despite C-3PO and Lost in Space, have never really existed. Until three or four years ago, they never existed in the way that we think of. So DARPA said, we'll give three and a half million dollars in prizes. You have to come up with an autonomous robot that could have driven up to do these eight tasks, driven up to a power plant, get out of the car, open a door, turn the water valve to shut it off, cut a hole in a wall to let a trapped person out, then there's going to be a surprise task, which turned out to be unplugging a power socket and replugging it into a neighboring one, uh, cross over some rubble, and then climb up in front of a flight of stairs. I took my kids to this. It was last spring, last summer, I guess, in, in California. It was the coolest thing. Here's a little medley I made with my phone. This is Carnegie Mellon's robot driving up. Now, right now, it's under remote control by the operators. But once it gets inside the mock-up of the power plant, they degrade the Wi-Fi. This robot is autonomous. It is self-driven. There it is, opening a handle designed for human hands. Goes inside. And the audience was going nuts. They were like applauding it like it was a Iron Man. Um, so that red thing, that's the water winch. Had to turn that. Picks up a Black & Decker power drill. Has to cut a hole in the sheetrock big enough for a human to escape. There's the electric power plug, the surprise task. There's the cinder blocks he had to cross over. And then he walked up the stairs and everybody went crazy. So sometimes I'll show people this, this video and they're like, oh my God, this is it. You know, the robot uprising is about to begin. They're gonna take over and, and be our overlords. And just to reassure you, I also made this video of outtakes. Ah, oh, it's a machine. <laughs> Carnegie Mellon. <laughs> Too much coffee. <laughs> you missed the witch. <laughs> so. I mean, interestingly, most of them then got up and proceeded. The winner came from South Korea, did all eight of those tasks in 30 minutes flawlessly. It was a spectacle to behold. And, you know, to me, the, the, I interviewed the head of this DARPA project, and he said, there's no question in my mind, having seen this, that when we are old and infirm, we can live in our homes and these things will be taking care of us. And I think he's absolutely right. Those robots that you just saw did not exist three years ago. 
And all of a sudden, they're like rescuing people from a power plant. So uh, they're coming along so fast. And not just in robots. You've heard about the drones, you know, revolutionizing movie making and engineering. They can inspect skyscrapers and bridges without risking people's lives climbing. Um, revolutionizing package delivery. This is Amazon's program called Prime Air. You'll order something from Amazon and they'll deliver it to you in 30 minutes by drone. This is the video they showed on, on 60 Minutes when they unveiled this a year ago. Uh, it'll deliver anything under five pounds, which is 80% of what Amazon sells. But that was, that was a mock-up. That was a, a commercial. Last month, they unveiled this. This is the real thing. What they came up with is a hybrid airplane uh, helicopter. It lifts up to t uh, above 200 feet, then the propeller kicks in and it goes horizontally. Um, it has a 10 mile range, 5 mile payload, and what you'll do is you'll put out this special mat in your yard or on your patio or roof, wherever you want it to deliver, and it will find that, deliver the package. This is not a simulation, this is really working. And they say they're ready to roll with this. The only thing holding them back is the fact that there is no uh, FAA clarity on the legality of filling our skies with commercial drones. They're still hammering that out. But they say the minute the FAA has that settled, uh, they'll do this. Um, and I said, well, what if the FAA takes too long? And he goes, well, no reason the United States has to be the first. So Europe, they don't have these regulations. So they're, they are ready to launch over there. Um, and of course, you've heard of the self-driving car. This is Google's self-driving car project. It's driven 1.8 million miles without a single accident. Actually, that's not quite true. Um, they've been in 11 accidents, but all 11 were when the Google car was stopped at a light and some moron rear-ended them. <laughs> so for that reason, Google's next self-driving car is this. They have removed the steering wheel. The only problem with self-driving cars is that they have to share the road with humans who are the world's worst drivers. I mean, people say, I don't want to share my road with some robot. You know what? I don't want to share my roads with you. I mean, 100% of accidents are caused by people, last I read. So I personally cannot wait for this. And we are so close. I mean, five, six years, so close to having this be ready. Um, I've tested cars that already uh, accelerate, slow down, stay in the lane, and park by themselves. They're for sale today. The only thing they don't do now is make turns for you, and, that's, and even the Tesla S will do that now. Um, so the, the mind blower, people, the mind blower is when the day comes that we combine Uber with self-driving cars. At that point, you will summon a car to pick you up and give you a ride and not involve any people. This is such a much, think of how much infrastructure there is built around our fallibility as drivers. All of these things will go away. Driver's ed and driver's licenses. You won't need one. Car insurance. You won't own a car. You won't need one. Speed limits. Those are for people. Garages at home, you won't have one. Why not build that into a guest bedroom? You won't own a car. Drunk driving, get as drunk as you want. <laughs> Honking car alarms, there won't be cars parked. Motels, motels were created for people who get sleepy on drives to Florida. So fine, sleep. The car will get you there. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, so no one's going to own cars? And the answer to that is no, not nobody. There will still be car ownership. It's too built into the male DNA, you know, to own a car and be proud and have a muscle car. So there will be both. Uh, but there's no question in my mind. I'm not one of these guys who says, you know, X is going to replace Y. You know, e-books. That means there's going to be no more printed books. No, it never works out like that. But in this case, they are coming, I guarantee you. Um, so the interesting thing is how this all affects the incoming generation. The kids who started college last year, as you may have read, have never been alive without the internet. 
It existed the day they were born, like running water. It changes everything. Um, Microsoft, a guy from Microsoft's Human Resources Department told me that he's getting applications from college kids to work at Microsoft who are leaving two fields blank. The home phone number, of course, who has one of those anymore, and the email address. They don't do email. Email use among under 25 year olds is down 62% in five years. Um, a guy told me that he took his daughter, nine years old, to take your daughter to work day to his office. She had never seen a telephone with a cord on it. <laughs> she had never seen one before. And she's like, hey dad, what's this? Oh, I get it, so you don't lose it. <laughs> Everything has to be real time. It has to be text messages, Facebook messages, on-demand music from iTunes, TV from Hulu, movies from Netflix, books and newspapers on your Kindle. So huge mega trends. These are the kinds of things that are all on the way out. Anything with disks and wires that's stationary, the one-way communication from company to customer. Now everything is, is autonomous and wireless, real-time, wearable. The number one question I get is technology is going so fast, how am I supposed to keep up with all this? And, and I'm, I'm worried about our children. Their faces are buried in screens. And what about brain cancer and all this? And all I can say to you is that when you look at the big picture of civilization, every new technology has been scary. Microwaves were supposed to give you cancer. They don't. Airplanes were supposed to kill you. Commercial air travel, cardiologists warned that the blood will pool in the back of your heart and kill you. It doesn't. When tractors appeared in the fields in the 1850s, they were called the work of the devil. Every new technology is frightening, and somehow every time we muddle through. Now it's the internet that's going to ruin our brains. Before that, it was TV. Before that, it was radio. It's always something. The incoming generation does look alien to us, but they are the status quo. The only thing I can tell you for sure is that it's going to be a wild ride. Thank you very much. <clears throat>I couldn't help noticing that by pure coincidence, there's uh, what appears to be a piano on stage. Um, in my former life, before I was a technology guy, believe it or not, I was a Broadway conductor. I was a musician in the theater. And people sometimes ask, do you still do, uh, do, you still do music? And the answer is sort of. I have a habit where I, I write new words to old melodies about the tech industry. Would you like to hear one of these? <laughs> <laughs> Did you really think you had a choice? <laughs> so this is a, a medley. It's the history of downloadable music and video in two minutes. <clears throat> it's nine o'clock on a Saturday. The record store is closed for the night. So I fire up the old iTunes music store and soon I am feeling all right. I know Steve Jobs can find me a melody with one dollar pricing that rocks. I can type in a track and get album names back while still in my undies and socks. Sell me a song, you're the music man. My iPod's got 10 gigs to go. Yeah, we might prefer more compatibility, but Steve likes to run the whole show. I heard Desperate Housewives was great last night, but I ate a bad piece of cod. As I threw up my meal, I said, it's no big deal. I'll watch it tonight on my pod. And now all of the networks are joining in. Two bucks a show without ads. It's a business those guys always wanted to try, but only Steve Jobs had the nads. Sell me a show, you're the TV man. Steve's got the first TV store. Yeah, the DVD costs less per episode, but who watches those anymore? 
They say we're young, don't watch TV. They say the internet is all we see. But that's not true, they've got it wrong. See, all our shows are just two minutes long. Hey, I got YouTube. I got YouTube. Millennials won't follow news. The New York Times can only stand to lose. If all the papers go away, how will we learn the stories of the day? Dude, we got YouTube. Make that GooTube. See, because Google bought YouTube. So they call it, oh, never mind. All right. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, I have for you a tribute to the RIAA. That is the Recording Industry Association of America. That's the, the trade group that's been suing children for downloading songs. Young man, you were surfing along and then dumb man, you downloaded a song and then young man, copied it to your pod, then a phone call came to tell you You've just been sued by the RIAA. You've just been screwed by the RIAA. Their attorneys say you committed a crime, and there better not be a next time. They've lost their minds at the RIAA. Justice is blind at the RIAA. You're depriving the fans. You are learning to steal. You can't do whatever you feel. You know what? They will sue your butt clean. They say, so what? If you're only 13. And you know what? They were equally mean to an 80 year old grandma. CD sales have dropped every year. They're not greedy. They're just quaking with fear. Yes, indeedy. What if their end is near and we download all our music? Yeah, that would piss off the RIAA. No plastic discs from the RIAA. What a way to make friends. It's a plan that can't fail. Haul your customers off to jail. And who'll be next for the RIAA? What else is vexing the RIAA? Maybe whistling a tune, maybe humming along, maybe mocking them in a song. Thank you very much, you guys. Thanks for keeping the lights on.